Welcome to another podcast, and today is a really, really special honor for me because I am introducing you to the very first person that I submitted to as a coach, as a one-on-one coach, and it's been a few years, uh, but he has helped me get on the right track, and he's helped countless other people get on the right track. Marv, welcome to our podcast. Thank you so much for coming. Oh, thanks, Kara, for having me. I didn't realize I was coaching you. I just thought we were getting together. Oh, wow. No, it was definitely, I was definitely getting coached. As a matter of fact, I remember the price of the coaching was a cup of coffee. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, it was, it was quite a deal. I got, I got definitely the better end of the (laughs) stick there. So so thank you for that. So um, our podcast is Think Your Way to an Epic Life. Mm -hmm. And the way I see your life from the outside looking in, you have a pretty epic life. Mm. How did you get to there? Where did you start off? Let's start off in, and where were you born? What was your childhood like? Uh, well, I'm native New Mexican, grew up in Albuquerque. We lived in the South Valley until I was three. And then we moved out to the East Mountains. and uh, Pretty much lived there until I was an adult, which when we first moved out there, it was the middle of nowhere. Uh, not so much today. Yeah. But um, yeah, I actually was adopted um, by just a great couple. My parents were really, really, really hard workers and, um, you know, great people, uh, well-liked in the community. Uh, the kind of people when that somebody finds out you're their son, right away you have credibility and status, right? Um, they didn't have a lot of earning power, so they, bro- they both worked hard, but uh, things were pretty scarce. And uh, you know, I've heard people say we were poor and didn't know it. I was pretty sure we were poor growing <laughs> up. So, uh, yeah, I didn't really have that problem. So what was that like knowing that you were poor? Well, it was hard. You know, there's always shame associated with that. Um, shame in the way you live. Um, you know, I think you feel like there's this this success or prosperity or stability that other people have that for some reason it's just not available to you. And so I think it's easy to adopt a mindset of this is kind of where I am and this is where I'll be. And um, it's probably not going to get a whole lot better. But it did for you. Yeah, it did. Absolutely did. So what was the turning point? Well, I mean, a few things. Uh, there were certain people that came into my life at very strategic times to uh, teach me things I hadn't learned before and kind of help me see how the world works and how business works and things like that. Um, honestly, one of the biggest life changers for me was when I was 18 years old, um, after having made a lot of terrible decisions that made my life a real wreck, um, I... I met Christ and it totally changed my life. I had been that teenager that you hope your kids never become and uh, was incredibly rebellious and would run away from home because I didn't like the rules at home and would sleep behind the frontier. And there was a church in the neighborhood I knew how to break into because they had a key hidden. So I'd go sleep there or I'd couch surf. And then I would go back home and um, decided to like the rules again and leave and um, drugs and just everything associated with that. And uh, it could have turned out much differently had I not, had God not intervened in my life. So, Wow, that's, that's a true saving grace. And we have talked about this in the past, and it's very rare, in, in my ever so humble opinion, it's very rare for someone to meet Christ and immediately be so different. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I was different... Um, a lot of things changed. There were things that changed much more gradually. So the, um, the destructive behavior changed immediately. And I don't know why, because that doesn't happen that way for a lot of people. Uh, but I still didn't really know how to make a living. I had dropped out of high school and I was pumping gas and doing some construction. And um, I had always, um, I'd always liked sort of working for myself. So like I had, done house painting and landscaping and some things like that, but uh, could never make a living at it. And um, so figuring out how to make a living, learning all the things that are associated with that, um, that took more time. Okay, so you were on one trajectory 
and at 18, how, how did you meet Christ? Um, I was a house painter, and I was working for somebody else, and I was on the side of a building painting, and um, had known for a while that I really needed to make a change, or I wasn't going to last much longer, and yet I couldn't, I couldn't change my life. I kept trying, and um, I had people in my life who were praying for me, and who had kind of told me how God wants a relationship with me, and all of that, and I just you know, thought everything from, well, I'm not sure that's true to, uh, like everything else, it's just not for me. Like, you know, and, and also I sort of felt like I had to clean my life up and then maybe God would take me and do something. And, um, that day just, uh, I didn't hear a voice, didn't see a vision. Would have been cool if I had. Right. Um, but he just made clear to me that you have to come to me all screwed up like you are, and I will fix it. And he did. That is so cool. That is so not. He fixed much of it quickly, and then some of it he's still working on. Amen. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so you're job to job to job. You don't know how to really make a living. Yeah. And you retired last year or two years? Depends on how you define retirement. I mean, I don't think of myself as retired in the traditional sense that I traded my, you know, work day for a life of leisure time. I I have more leisure than I did, and I sleep later than I used to. But I sold a business three years ago. Three years, okay. Yeah, but um, I I'm involved in a lot of things, and um, we'll get into all those because they're very fascinating, okay. and we, we're going to send you some send you some potential people too. I'm sure through this. So how did you go from being a house painter to starting the business that you sold three years ago that was a well, worldwide business, very well, successful? You know, I, I um, yeah, I, I didn't know much about anything. And I answered an ad in the newspaper that said, I need six people to help me in my small appliance business. No experience necessary, will train. Well, I thought it was, they were going to teach me to fix color TVs. It turned out to be a blind sales ad to sell vacuum cleaners door to door. And they just did a selling job on me in the interview and told me that this was going to be the chance of a lifetime and I'd be rich someday. And so I tried it and, um, you know, it, it's a people factory. I mean, you hire people all week and then they go do demonstrations to their relatives and 90% of them bail out in two days. And um, so if, if you last a month, they'll make you training manager. If you last six months, they'll make you sales manager. And if you can hang in there for a year, you can have your own office. So I did and uh, learned how to sell and didn't learn a lot about how to run a business. I ended up with two offices, one in Albuquerque, one in Santa Fe, ran them both into the ground and um, had to close the doors with a lot of debt because I didn't have any cash flow because I didn't know how that worked. And um, so I left there and uh, met a guy who was looking for a salesperson and, um, for this company that sold uh, color-coded filing systems like you see in your doctor's office, little sticky labels and folders and, and inventory control systems. And, and I didn't know a lot about that stuff. And I just, I said, can you really make a living doing this? And he said, oh yeah, it's great, you'll love it. So I went to work for him and then um, hung around long enough till he wanted to retire and bought the business. So. At what age were you when that happened? When I got the when job. When you bought the business. Uh, that was uh, 20 years ago, 22 years ago. So I'm 68 now. So What? 40. You're looking so good. Look at yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, no, for real. It's it, the camera. It's a very expensive camera. <laughs> it's a very expensive camera. Yes, yes. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay. Yeah. So, so 50, 48 years old, you buy this business. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Sounds right. How did it? feel to buy the business. First of all, first of all, I want to want to say part of the reason I think you were such a good coach to me mm-hmm. was because you ran those two uh was it Kirby or Rainbow? Rainbow vacuum. Rainbow, yeah, Rainbow vacuum Kirby. cleaner. I'm Rainbow. sorry, my bad. Uh but you you ran those into the ground because they taught you how to sell but they didn't ha- t- teach you how to run a business. Yeah, and I also ran a painting <clears throat> business in, a painting business into the ground. And then when I was 10 years old, I ran a Christmas card selling business into the ground. So I had a lot of uh a lot of experience running businesses into the ground. Yeah. So would you say that 
your your strategy has been to fail your way forward? It's not a strategy, but it's worked out. <laughs> <It's> r- <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a planner. I'm not super strategic. I, it just works out. But but you know, I so in the rainbow business, the guy that ran that business uh, taught me how to sell. He really changed my life and how he taught me how to sell. Um, and then um, there were some other people in my life who'd been in business. I worked for some of them early on that taught me other things about how to be a good contributor to the business, how to be a good employee, uh, what's important to a business owner. Uh, the guy I bought the business from um, taught me how to run a business operationally and how to read a PL and, you know, what to think about. And so, you know, it, it's it's been this series of these, what I consider divine appointments with people who taught me the things I needed to know. And you were, and it's still happening. I mean, I'm still meeting people, teaching me things. So, absolutely, uh, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna go off. Of, my my filter kicked okay. in. It kicked in just a little bit there. All right. So you buy this business, and now it's yours. At that mm-hmm. point, how many employees were working there? There were probably 40-ish, I would think. Wow. So you bought a business with 40 employees. All of a sudden, you now own this. How did that feel? Well, uh, I had I didn't have any money. I mean, I made pretty good money um, as a salesperson there. And then eventually I became the general manager and I was running the business. But I mean, still, I didn't have the kind of capital it took to buy the business. Um, so the the owner did a hundred percent owner finance deal, and I bought it with no, no money down, and just here's this gigantic payment you've got to make every month. So, um, yeah, it was frightening. <laughs> Ooh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was. So, was uh, was there ever a time that you had to use your own personal funds to meet payroll? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, so being successful isn't just somebody looks at at your success and goes, "Oh, it was just easy." What would you say to them? Well, I would say, how do you, how are you defining success? I mean, yeah, you, you know, you have, you have some means, you've, you've gotten some traction. Um, yeah, most people, uh, what you don't be, see behind that is the times that people were on the edge and about to lose it all. And everybody that's in business has been there. But, but the general public doesn't know that. I don't think, I don't think. Yeah, if you haven't, yeah, if you haven't been close to it, you, you probably don't realize that. And, you know, I mean, there was there were three distinct times over the period that I owned the business that we were on the edge. One, we were actually over the edge and we still survived. But, um, you know, when you, when you get to that place, you feel this tremendous responsibility for the people that work for you. And you're thinking, here, I've, I've taken this business that some guy started and it's turned into this going concern and I just ruined it and I'm going to ruin the, all these people's lives. And then the other thing is they're all going to go get another job you're going to lose everything, including your house, and probably live in a box. And it'll take it'll take a year to unwind it. So it isn't even that if the business goes under, um, you just walk away the next day. You got all these obligations you got to wrap up, and so you know if you think about that too much, it's hard. It's hard on you. So you just have to keep going. You just kind of put it in a box, it yeah. and then close it up and deal with it when you can. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So you had 40 when you started and, and what was, what were the major things that the business was doing at that point? We focused on uh, helping people manage documents and information more effectively and um, stuff that they stored. So it could be weapons for the military, could be inventory for manufacturers, uh, documents and filing for corporate businesses. Um, mainly to do with efficiently storing and accessing material and information. Okay. Yeah. And then it grew a little bit. So mm-hmm. at, at when you bought it, was Matt already, your son Matt, was he already working there? No, I think he was like 10 years old. Wow. Yeah, probably. Well, he might have been, but no. Okay. So no Matt, 40 employees. Did you have somebody you could lean on? Did you have an employee that was... Well, yeah, I mean, we, we had great employees. People had been there a long time. We had a leadership team. You know, we had people people managing different aspects of the business. So, yeah, I wasn't in it by myself at all. Okay. 
And so by the time that you sold it three years ago, how many employees were there? Um, probably 50 or 60. Um, you know, a few contractors. Um, the size of the business, top line and bottom line, had grown exponentially. But, uh, you know, we were never trying to figure out how to, how to hire more people. We were always just trying to figure out how do we do the job with the right number. Right. You, people can do a lot more than they think they can. Yeah. If, yeah. If you hire the right people or you hire people that know they can and they get it done. Right. There you go. All right. So you, you went, when it was time to sell the business three years ago, um, how did that work out? Who did you sell it to? I've sold it to the employees. Actually, we did an ESOP. Um, my son had been a shareholder in the business he had bought in uh, a few years ago and um, so he's the, he's the president now he's, he's running the business, but it's an employee owned business now. So what well, would you say that had that changed the culture? No, I don't think so. I, I think, um, we, we talked to a lot of people who had done ESOPs. We hired some consultants that helped us kind of through the process and we consistently heard you're not going to take someone who's unengaged and make them engaged because now they have employee ownership. And partly because this is really a retirement plan for the employee. So they don't cash in until they leave or they retire. So it's, it's a long play. And, you know, most of us are not focused on that far out. Um, I think it helps in recruiting. You know, you can tell people, hey, we're an ESOP. So when you come in, you can, you know, you have value in the business. Um, so I, I wouldn't say that it created a culture that wasn't already there. So how did I think you, it worked because the culture was already there. So how did you create that culture? The culture that was there, the good culture that you had in that business. How, what did you? Well, man, I would love to say that, you know, I shut my door one day and said, what kind of culture am I going to create? And went out and created it. Um, the culture of any organization is a reflection of whoever runs that organization. So, um, and then it can attract people. It can, it can attract people who share those values. And um, so we just tried to live out the values that we had. And those who didn't share the values, they typically don't stay. Got it. So they kind of call themselves and you don't have yeah. to do it. So you sold the business, um, and and before you sold the business, you had started your what you're doing now, right? The the loan company. No, that was actually after. It was after. Okay, so tell us a little bit about what you're doing now since retirement. Well, so I started. Uh, uh, my wife and I started a small loan business. We're a licensed uh, lender, the same kind of license that a uh, title loan company would have, a finance company would have. And we loan to people who would traditionally have to go to a high interest lender because either they have no credit or they have bad credit or they're not banked or they have some issue in their life. Um, and, but we loan at low interest rates and we don't require a stellar credit rating. We don't require collateral. We do require that you enter into a coaching relationship with a coach that we provide who helps with sort of financial literacy and coaching on, you know, how to get ahead. And so what are the results? Cause I, I don't, I don't know about anybody listening. I'm thinking, okay, these people are credit problems and you're mm -hmm. loaning the money. How, what, how does that work? Well, uh, it works really well with some and not so well with others. Right. Sure. Um, we, uh, we're actually modeled after after a global lender called Kiva, and um, they have a three percent default rate, and it works for them at three percent. Um, ours is about ten right now. We're still trying to figure it out, um, but we figure if we can get it down to three percent, the business will be sustainable, and we get the volume up high enough. Um, three years ago, the what they call the predatory lending market in New Mexico did two hundred and twenty million dollars in loans to one hundred and seventy seven thousand people. Prior to this past legislative session, the interest rates in New Mexico were capped at 175%. Oh, no. They're now capped at 36. Well, we've taken out a lot of loans that people got uh, online 
or off out of the state that are 600% interest. And so, and, you know, there's always an appetite in the community to shut down high interest lenders, but the people who go to those high interest lenders, they have no other alternative. If their car breaks down and they don't get their car fixed, they're probably in an expendable job and there's five other people waiting for that job. They'll just lose their job. And they don't have money. Their family doesn't have money. They don't have credit. What are they supposed to do? So you can't just say, we're going to shut down these predatory lenders without providing some kind of an alternative. And I've experienced that in my past. And so I, I, I understood and understand what that is like. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's making a difference in some people's lives. And we're not so sure in others. And we're really trying to figure the coaching part out. I think that that's the constraint for us right now. And um, yeah, but it's cool. I mean, we've got relationship with, relationships with, with great people who are our customers and we text and, you know, yeah, it's good. It's like a family almost. Some of it. <laughs> so, so tell me, a, tell me a success story from this, from the lending that you've done. Um, we have a customer who was um, uh, in an abusive relationship about to be on the street. Um, we have a lot of these stories actually about to be on the street. Um, $3,000 would keep them in the home, they and their children in the home. And we, we were able to do the loan. And they're still in their home today. Wow. You know? Um, had another one in an abusive situation. There's a program in town that will provide housing and uh, money for furnishings for people who come out of an abusive relationship, but it uh, reimburses the, uh, the client for money that they've already spent. And often they don't have the money to spend, right? So we fronted the money at times so that they can get set up and then they get reimbursed later and they can pay us back. How do they find you? Uh, right now it's all referral. There's five partners that we work with, uh, four nonprofits and a for-profit business, and they come to us through them. So we're currently not just doing blanket marketing, but we may start doing that. Okay. So, because, I mean, it sounds like something that people need to know about that. What, what, what capacity do you see that this could go to? Well, if, I mean, if you got 10% of the market, that's $20 million. So um, I don't know. Uh, it could be as, as big as any lending market. Uh, again, the, the, the constraint is how do you, how do you coach well? Because often we see people in this situation that our customers are in and we say, well, if they just knew how to manage their money, everything would be fine. Their problems are far more complex than that. And so it's not just an information problem. Sometimes it's not an information problem at all. And so um, if, if your approach to it is, I have resources and I have knowledge that you don't, and I'm going to hand those to you and that's going to fix your problem. Uh, that's not going to fix the problem. And um, I was at a uh, fundraise. I don't know how, how to tell this story in, in a meaningful way without divulging things that probably are too private, but I was at a fundraiser and there was a group of people there with, uh, with, with means. And there were a couple of people there who were, had been served by the nonprofit that were um, that the fundraiser was for, and they had been there just to tell their story. And I was talking to one of these ladies who had told her story, and as she talked about her life and her family, I realized she, relationally she's the wealthiest person on this patio. And if you if you sat and looked at everyone on the patio, you would look at her and think boy, this lady really needs a lot of help. And as we talked, I realized she has more relationships, better relationships, and deeper relationships than I have. And I could learn a lot from her in how to cultivate those relationships. And so um, this is a, we say that we do relationship-based lending because it is a relationship. Uh, I mean, we have money to lend, 
but our customers have so much to offer me and us and the organizations that we're connected to because of the areas in their life where they're thriving. And our goal is to see our customers and the community thrive holistically. So you're giving them dignity along with along. Yeah, protecting their dignity. They already have it. We just, often you don't see it. And I also feel like often someone in a power position like a lender may look down on their clients instead of, oh, wow, I could learn a lot from you. Yeah. So that's pretty beautiful. And it, it, I mean, it it does create a power, power power-based relationship. I mean, you do have power. And in fact, there's a proverb about how the, the borrower becomes a slave to the lender. And that's true. You know, I mean, whether it's, whether you're making a million dollars a year and, you know, you have a $5 million mortgage that, that lending company owns you to some degree, right? They get to make some decisions for you. Right. Right. Wow. Okay. So you've got, you've got this unbelievably successful lending business going, started running, well, um, I would not say it's unbelievably successful, no, but I would say it's going. It's it's on the road. You've been yeah, three going. years. Mm-hmm. Okay. So what do you need for it to go to the next level? What's missing? Um, an effective coaching path, I think. In fact, I um, there's a um, I, I just got connected through another thing I'm involved in to a virtual bank that. Uh, is tailored for the immigrant population who have a hard time becoming banked. And so their, their, their bank is available in 12 languages just on your phone. Um, uh, actually, in a conversation with them about uh, developing some coaching tools because one of their principals actually owns a, a, a business in Singapore that develops online learning. So um, okay, we'll see. Yeah. We'll see. So do you, do you have, uh, how many people are involved in this business now that, that work with you? Uh, my wife and I. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Wow. How's that working? Um, you know, I've never been a bookkeeper before and now I am. So. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we, we do have, um, we do have coaches that are not paid that we're connected to. Okay. So. And so how, how, what is Barb's job in this? By the way, he has the most stunningly beautiful wife you could imagine. <laughs> I don't know how you pulled that off. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Caught her at a weak moment, I think. <laughs> um, you know, she she's uh, she worked in an accounting department of a large construction company at one time uh, and had had enough. So she doesn't help with the bookkeeping. She... <laughs> <laughs> you can't make me. <laughs> but she's incredibly supportive of the whole, you know, the whole thing and we're in it together. And Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's got to be kind of unique, too, because it was almost as if you were separated, probably, all the years that you were working and pouring into your company. Or no, it wasn't for you. She never worked in the business. Uh, when I had the, the vacuum cleaner business, we worked together for a while and realized we could either work together or be married. And so we decided to be married. Uh Um, But uh, I mean, she was, she was in it, in it with me in the, in the business as well. I mean, sure. Yeah, sure. So, so how is it now that you're able to work together and be married? Well, I, I wouldn't say we're working together. I mean, she's not, she's not uh, performing tasks in the business. Okay. But we make decisions together. And Got it. Um, so, I mean, we're in it together from that standpoint. But, you know, it's not, um, it doesn't take hours and hours now to do the work. It's not a full-time job for me, so. Okay, good. So what are you doing with your time now that you're retired? Well, I, I'm, I'm not retired. I know, I know. You retired from the big company. <laughs> I sold the business. Um, I'm on uh, some nonprofit boards. Okay. And um, yeah, and and uh, those are all trying to grow. So you know that's interesting right now is trying to figure out how to how to grow those, increase the impact, increase the footprint. Um, I do some business consulting through 
an organization that consults primarily overseas in emerging markets with businesses that are in really hard places that are uh, starting up or trying to grow. And so that, that's interesting. Okay, so, so let's go down that road just a little bit. Most of the people that are watching this are probably entrepreneurs, most mm -hmm. of them. What, what, was, what are some of the biggest ahas that you had when somebody showed you something and you're just blown away? This is so much better than the way I was doing it. Um, you mean just in general? In business. Uh, <laughs> managing cash flow, probably. Um, we, uh, we had hired a, uh, a CFO at Improve Group, my previous company. Uh, we'd never had one before. We'd had a controller, but never a C-level financial person. And um, he, was, he was a little surprised, I think, at how poorly we managed the money in the business, um, and, um, which we recognized we had a need. That's why we brought the guy in. And he came from a bigger company, had, had been in some M&A uh, uh, he, he had done some M&A work for those companies. So, you know, he, he knew what was going on and basically taught us to project out our revenue, expenses, costs, and income 12 months ahead. And um, the, uh, the first meeting he had with our sales manager, he said, I, I need a sales projection for the next 90 days. I need to know what's going to come in. And um, the sales manager was telling him, uh, well, I'm not really sure we can do that and kind of hemming and hawing about it. And, and Jim, the CFO, said, you're the sales manager, right? And he said, well, yeah. And he said, well, your job is to manage the sales, right? And he said, well, yeah. And he said, so you can get me a projection in, over the next 90 days, right? And so then that became the habit for us is that we actually projected what was going on and really saved our life uh, during one of those downturns. So uh, I think, um, you know, a lot of times you start a business, you have a passion for what you're doing. Um, you know, you, you want to make a difference. You want to build something. And um, a lot of times you're really good at the rainmaking and not quite as good at the details and the operations. And, um, there was a time when I thought we could sell our way out of any problem. And I learned that that can create more problems. So you need somebody who's strong. Repeat that, please. You can't sell your <laughs> you way. Can't, you're, you can't necessarily sell your way out of problems and downturns. So that I would say is probably the biggest, um, mistake that entrepreneurs make is believing that. Yeah, I, I think so. Be, you know, and I, and I think most entrepreneurs are, they're this weird combination of eternal optimism and confidence and um, extreme self-doubt and paranoia. <laughs> and, you know, most people I know who own a business uh, believe there's a catastrophe right around the corner or that light at the end of the tunnel is really the headlight on a train that's about to run them over. And um, sometimes when the fire starts, you just sort of put your head down and sell, 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 or whatever part of the business you're good at. You really need people around you that can bring the expertise to all the different aspects of the business. So in our industry here, we call that leverage. So you're leveraging out the things that you're not good at or you don't mm -hmm. like. Yeah. How quickly should someone who's an entrepreneur, who's a great rainmaker and is a great salesperson, how quickly should they get that person, that administrative person? Before you start the business. Now, it doesn't mean they have to be on your payroll because you have to have cash to pay them. <laughs> but um, one of the mistakes I made early on was not having advisors around me. Advisors who understood my business well enough to give me good advice. And uh, we eventually put a board together of three really smart people. And uh, we pay them. And they get a financial for the business. And they're intimately acquainted with what's going on. And we have a four or five hour meeting every quarter with them. And, um, you know, you need that kind of voice in your life and in your business. So 
I would not, and we tell this in the businesses that we consult with overseas. I mean, often this is someone who um, is in, you know, the Middle East trying to start a business. They, um, they're either very, very, they're all undercapitalized. So maybe they're a native to that city that they live in, but there are so few resources. Um, and often they just try to start it up and figure we'll figure it out as we go along, which again is a, a strength of an entrepreneurial mindset, but that only takes you so far. So find people, even before you can afford them, who will work for free and help you. And there are a lot of people out there. Who, but entrepreneurs who like to do don't really want anybody telling them what to do, right? No, and. I'm not saying they tell you what to do, but they give you advice. You can always say no, right? But right. you need people smarter than you around you. Absolutely. And, and, and I really, you're speaking right now, let's say you're speaking to, say, Ben, our marketing director, mm -hmm. and he has a company, mm -hmm. and he does video and all kinds of, he's just an amazing guy, and he's really, really good at all that. What would you tell him starting this brand new company? What would you tell him? What do you need to do to make this? Um, I would I tell him to um, to get some ex operational expertise in the business, um, whether that's volunteer help or pay someone a little bit. Um, you know, the Harvard Business Review had an article a few years ago at the, about the five stages that an organization goes through, typically. They've identif identified five general stages that a business goes through from startup, um, the owners doing everything, to, well, basically stagnation because you got too big. But um, the thing that, that, that makes you thrive in stage one will prevent you from getting to stage two if you don't make some, sta some changes. And the same thing is true with stage three and four and then into stage five. So... To, to, to make the leap to the next stage, you've got to have the right people in place to begin to offload the day-to-day -day that the owner is doing so that they can get higher up and um, think more long-term and work on the business, not in the business. Okay. So starting off, you, you start off and you think, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm going to run, I'm going to go, and I don't really need any help to if if you will listen to the advice of this man i can assure you it will absolutely revolutionize your business it will i mean it did for me mm -hmm. and but we're so resistant that it's entrepreneurs are boy we're a mess i mean we're just a mess we're just so resistant to no i'm just going to go do what i do and i'm good at it and it's all going to work out so what could you say that would make somebody get past that and, and understand that it doesn't mean that you're weak, that you're asking for help. It means that you're strong. Well, I mean, you'll get past it. You'll either get past it because you drove the business into, a, into the ground and started over and said, maybe this time I'll try something a little different. Or, um, you know, you'll start to make the decision. I mean, it's... It is a mindset, uh, you know, sometimes it's a fear of not looking competent. And so you don't wanna ask for help because you don't want people to think you don't know. Sometimes it's, you don't even know what questions to ask. You don't even know what you need, right? And so um, what, what we try to do when we work with, start with businesses that are just starting up, we go through the business model canvas with them and it basically outlines the nine areas you need to pay attention to if this business is gonna work. And then um, you just start a series of experiments to test your hypotheses to see if they're true, to see if it's gonna work, and then you adjust where necessary. Going back, anything you would have done differently in your career, all of your career? If, knowing what you know now, what would you have done differently? I would have gone to college. Would you? <laughs> I would have, yeah. Okay. Yeah, because you uh, you develop long-term relationships. The people I know 
who <laughs> went to college. You know, I mean, th- there's just there are things you you gain aside from the coursework. Right. Um, and um, you know, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I I can I can see how if I had maybe gotten advisors sooner, I might have avoided this problem or that problem. But I mean, all those things that went on before have made me who I am. And so I don't know that I would change anything. Um, That's a very cool place to be. And, and I'm not saying I don't have regrets. I, I have regrets. But I'm, I'm just saying that, and, and part of it's my worldview that, um, you know, I believe I was created by a personal being who's paying attention to me and at work in me. And, and I, I, I feel like the steps I've taken have been, even in spite of me at times, directed by, by God. And so, I don't know. <laughs> I it's don't a great know. question. Th- thank you. Thank you. It happens every <laughs> now and then. Uh, okay. So uh, right now, you, uh, you, you're thinking because of the growing up, is poverty too strong of a word, growing up in poverty? Um, I mean, it, it's relative, right? There were certainly people poor. There were a lot of people with more money. Mm-hmm. I, I definitely had a poverty mindset. Okay. So how did you break free from that to, to get to where you are today? Well, I don't know if I did. I mean, I still, I still fight it, right? I mean, um, I... Um, some, you know, sometimes the business success I gained was because I really had no fallback position. I mean, it had to work. So it produced enough grit to hang in there. Um, sometimes I'm as surprised as anyone that this worked out. So um, I don't think it's necessary to overcome whatever the traumatic mindset is that's been created, whether you've been in a, come from a really abusive background um, or poverty or um, maybe you were in a very wealthy family where the relationships were not emphasized and you've got trauma from that, whatever it is, I think you have to contextualize it, not necessarily overcome it. Okay, explain because that. Those contextualize thing, it. Because those things, when I say contextualize, I mean, I, I, need to, I need to see them for what they are and admit them and face them. And then I need to understand that those things have built capacity and strength in me that I probably wouldn't have otherwise. And embrace the things that have happened in my life that are hard. Um, and realize that those can become strengths and not hold me back. How important are relationships in business? Um, well, I mean, business is all about relationships, right? I mean, it's relationships with your customers, relationships with your, uh, your employees, if you have them, relationships with vendors, um, customers. I'm not sure what all I said in the list. Um, And they need to be real relationships based on transparency, honesty, shared values. There's a a business incubator called Praxis Labs and um, they incubate a lot of, uh, a lot of different kinds of businesses, a lot of social, Good based businesses, and uh, they uh, they wrote a really interesting book um, where they identify three styles of business. There's the exploitive, which is building shareholder value at the expense of everyone but the shareholders, and um, their definition of success is in every situation I win, you lose. And there's the ethical business, which is based on building shareholder value in a fair way. And their uh, view of success is we both win in every transaction. Um, 
But they talk about the highest level of business, and that's a redemptive business, which shares shareholder value and which has to make a profit to be sustainable. But the business leader and the business itself sacrifices for the good of the community and the culture and the employees and the customers. And um, the guy that started Herman Miller Furniture, I can't remember his name, wrote a book, and he talked about how um, the, um, the job of the leader is to carry the burdens of those who follow them. And um, often as leaders, we put burdens on people. But our real job is to remove obstacles and make sure that they're not carrying a load that's not theirs to carry. So in a redemptive business, I'm looking for ways to, the way I would say it as a person of faith, to return the culture to as close to the way God intended it to be. Um, worldwide, over the t- past 25 years, 50% of the people living in poverty have made it to the middle class because of business and jobs. And worldwide? Worldwide. Huh. Those are people living on less than a dollar a day. And um, business and jobs done right are restorative. And relationships in business should be restorative. So it doesn't mean that if, you know, if I have an underemployed, underperforming employee or I have a toxic customer or a vendor that's bad for my business, it doesn't mean that I ignore the toxicity and just have a relationship at any, at any cost. I mean, it could be that I, <laughs> I sever the relationship, mm-hmm. right? But my goal in every relationship should be how do I make my interaction with you be as restorative as possible? And um, part of that's up to me, and part of it is up to you. That is that is gold. Yeah. Brilliant. All right. Any piece, any advice um, on life in general? Because you, you really, I, I have a dis, I have an unfair advantage because I know you so well. Um, your life is is wonderful. You've got a beautiful family. You've got kids. You've got grandkids. You've got so. So, what advice would you give to somebody who's who's twenty years old and is just really wanting to be able to have a life, a legacy that they're proud of? Hmm. I'm just surprised it worked out. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I don't know. I mean, I I remember early on hearing somebody say, if you. F- Focus on the depth of your character. The breadth of your influence will take care of itself. And, um, but, so, you know, I mean, that's the thing that matters. I mean, yeah, I'm very fortunate to have the family that I do. And um, I know people who were better at it than I am, and it didn't work out this way. Um, uh, for me personally, I hang on to uh, something Jesus said to his followers one day. He said, if you'll seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness, everything else will be added to you. So um, I'm, a, I'm terrible at seeking sometimes, but overall, that's my goal. And um, so I, I see that as the cause and the effect. But I, I realize someone who's not a person of faith who hears that doesn't resonate with it. And, um, so what would you say to a person that's not a person of faith? If they uh, if they apply the biblical principles that you're talking about, will it still work for them? Well, yeah, I believe so. I mean, I think that um, uh, Jesus gave a charge to his followers to go into all the world and teach people to apply everything he taught. Um, So if you apply everything he taught, your life will flourish. And whether it is, you know, to to forgive and not hold grudges and, um, you know, to not sleep around and to be faithful to your spouse and to your family and um, to, to be generous and all of those things, um, to experience the benefit of those things in this life, um, you don't have to believe he exists. It is, it's mind-blowing because you see marriages that are really good, and they're not believers. But if you, if you follow it, they're using the principles. They're still using yeah. the same principles. So, 
right. Yeah, and I, I think we've, I think we've made a mistake. In many in the faith community have made a mistake in thinking that um, only those who have faith um, are living the kind of life that God um, prescribes for us to live and um, are the only ones that can make a difference for good in the culture. And um, that's not true. Just quite frankly, it's just not true. Now, it doesn't address the eternal issue, which Jesus talked about a lot. So, but that's different. that's a different conversation. Yeah, we'll have a we'll have a whole different podcast <laughs> <Yeah>. on that. <laughs> okay, so um, your your life is good. You follow biblical principles, and basically, you're telling people if you follow biblical principles, no matter what your belief is, your life is going to flourish. Those were your words. Yeah. Well, you say my life is good. Um, I don't know if it is or not. I mean, I that almost sounds like I'm saying if you follow this formula, everything will be good for you. And that's not true. It's not true. Because there are a lot of people suffering all over the world who are doing a lot of right things. But um, we live in a world that's we got a lot of evil in it and bad in it, and we're victims of that at times, not because of anything that we have done. Right. Yeah, I appreciate you clarifying that because I don't want someone who's watching to think, I must not be doing things right because my life is messed up. Um, right. Because my life has been messed up and still is messed up, and your life has been messed up and still is messed up. Mm -hmm. I know you've got some health issues and things, you know. So so it, life's not going to be perfect um, for anyone, believer or non-believer, right. it's just not going to be perfect. Right. But it can be better. Yeah, and, and it's a matter of, um, uh, I think, make, making good decisions with whatever capacity and collateral you have. And then um, I think the more you use that to try to um, make the world around you and the people around you flourish, um, the more fulfilling that life is going to be for you. Okay. You know? All right. So as we're parting, tell us what your business needs. Is there anything that your business needs? Do you need investors? Do you need borrowers? What do you need? Um, we, d we don't need investors right now. Um, we have capacity for more borrowers. Okay. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, so we would you need, be. You need a world class coach to just come in and handle it, huh? Yeah, coaches. Coaches, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. So you're how do how do they get in touch with you? Um, they can go to our website, levantalending.com. Okay. Can you spell that? L e v a n t a, lending, dot com. And then uh, there's a an info link there where they can they can send us a message. Levanta means lift or get up in Spanish, and so our goal is to help is just to lift people with uh, with work we do. That's wonderful. So yeah. if you know of anyone that is really struggling and they're having a really hard time and they really don't have a place to turn, um, sometimes we've heard a success story already. Sometimes. Just three thousand dollars can keep a family into their into their home, and then they have the dignity to pay it back and get on with their lives. So I, I applaud you for for this. Yeah, and sometimes sometimes it's not even the money that they need. I mean, we know of a lot of resources in the city and that can help people. I mean, sometimes they just need somebody to help them think through the right the right path. So we don't have to lend money in order to have a conversation with somebody about how to how to get up. Okay, so you heard it. Just go to the website if you need some help getting up. Marv and his team will be happy to help you out, and you can trust them completely. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks.